my name is Matt Delacluse, General Manager of RACO Rents. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for our webinar on the importance of a basic IH field kit. Our presenter today is Dr. Brian Seal. During this webinar, he will cover the following. Importance of the field kit, preparation for survey, uh, essentials, rotating through your items, specialty items, and your questions answered at the end. Dr. Seal is an assistant professor at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches industrial hygiene courses for the safety sciences undergraduate and graduate programs. His experience spans nearly three decades in health and safety in the health and safety profession. He has worked in many industries, most recently as the industrial hygiene supervisor for the Pennsylvania OSHA consultation program, working with small businesses. Brian worked for OSHA as an area director at the national office in Washington, DC, in both the standards and the enforcement directorates. But perhaps his most fun, fun and challenging experience came as Navy industrial hygiene officer where he served at interesting ports like the NATO base in Keflavik, Iceland, and aboard the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise. He is a retired Navy industrial hygiene officer Welcome, Dr. Seal. Um, we are going to try something a little different. If you have any questions or would like to have uh, things answered during this presentation, please put them either in the question or your or the chat. All right, Dr. Seal, take it away. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Seal. As he, as Matt said, uh, the doctor thing is a fairly new addition, so I'm still getting used to that myself. So. Um, I tell everybody just call me Brian because that's what my name is. Um, I am a dirty hands industrial hygienist. That's what I tell the students, which means I like to be in the field. Although right now I'm in academia, I do still consult. Uh, I've been working with uh, Amanda there at Rico Rents because I teach some of the graduate classes in industrial hygiene here at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And I'm trying to figure out ways to get equipment into my grad students' hands when I'm teaching them and they're not here on campus so that they can hopefully learn a little bit better about what it is to be an industrial hygienist. They're all safety professionals, but they're not necessarily industrial hygienists. So today, I wanted to go through some of the basics. So that's my IH field kit, if you will, in all its glory. Uh, I was just talking with Matt before we started this that my undergrad students, this kit's going to actually probably be a little older than some of my undergrads because I bought this in January of 2002 when I first started consulting. So it's coming up on its 20, it can't drink yet, but it is um, coming up on 20 years of existence. And as I was talking with Amanda there at, and we we're working through the, the project I'm doing with my graduate students, I always tell my students, oh, you just have it in your, your field kit so that whenever you need it and you're doing sampling and whatnot, it's in the field kit so that you can, so it's it's kind of your, your MacGyver kit. So what I want to do today, I'm, I'm a more interactive um, teacher, if you will. I like to ask a lot of questions. I like to get input from there, and I know this isn't the best forum for that, but I'm only going to give you what I have. So this isn't a be all end all or an exhaustive list. So I would ask you if there's a way to put it in the chat, what you put in so that we can share our group knowledge. There's about 200 of you online right now, which is awesome and a little humbling for me. Um, but I would I would love to hear from you folks. I am on LinkedIn, so please feel free to link to, to reach out to me there too. But you know, this is just what I use. So my IH field kit and why it's important. Um, we all know we've all done air sampling for UIHs anyway, out there and there. I don't know what the demographics of the 200 folks that are on the call, um, but if you're an IH and you've done some sampling in there, you know things go wrong, especially if you're doing air sampling. Just, you know, the pump doesn't work or the media doesn't work or the adapter doesn't work or something. Something's just going to go wrong when you're out in the field. So you need to be able to, to make it work before you go back because you don't want to lose the data point that you're working so hard to get. Um, and you want to be prepared, because especially if you're a consultant, which many IHs are consultants, they don't want to look like idiots in front of their clients. So the better equipped you are with your field kit, 
the, the, the more uh, adaptable you are in the field. And I have to admit that I've been a little bit out of it. I mean, I, I still do go out into the field, but the last few years I've been teaching more full time and trying to finish up a PhD than I was um, out in the field. But now that that's done, I'm hoping to get back in the field more and more. But so just a quick outline, which Matt's already briefly said about, well, we're talking about the importance of the field kit. It's your MacGyver kit or your CSI kit if you're a CSI fan, you know, they always have that kit where they just keep pulling stuff out of it for whatever they need to be able to make it happen, to get the job done. A little bit of background, what influences are the purpose and, uh, of what we have in our kit, because the kit isn't static. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that kind of resides in the kit, but it does change as time goes on. And that's just, the picture I showed, is just the basic field kit there's still i always have a go bag so when i'm when i got to get out into the field that i have certain in for certain pieces in my go bag um, and you're going to have certain things again so when i go through that and i'm going through why i have different things i would welcome you to throw in what you throw in your go bag um, supplies for the field kit so we're going to go through a, a bit of my field kit what i what i leave residing in my field kit on a regular basis and then there's equipment that i rotate depending on the survey itself whether it be the location or the type um specialty items that i rent okay and then a little bit of a wrap up at the end so i don't expect it to take the whole hour but if we were able to communicate a little bit more directly, it would probably take that long because I'm sure every one of you, the 200 plus of you online, each have your own take on this. So this is just Brian's take. So just take it for what it is. Um, and if there's a few morsels of information you get out of that, great. Um, I will hope to get morsels from you as you share your information with me. That, that That's the two way give and take here. So first of all, what drives us to have a kit is why we're there to begin with. And so kind of a little bit of industrial hygiene 101 that my, my students have to go through when they take the first, first IH course with me is why the heck are we even there? Is it a complaint? So we're gonna want stuff in our kit that's gonna help us to be able to address the nature of the complaint. If I have an indoor air quality complaint as opposed to a lead, um, or a welding complaint or whatever might be driving that complaint may end up pushing what I throw into the kit for a particular purpose. I mean, if I'm doing indoor air quality, I may not need wipe samples, but if I'm doing something that's lead or heavy metal or welding, I might wanna do some welding, some uh, wipe samples. But then again, I might do wipe samples or swabs if I'm doing indoor air, if I'm thinking thinking microbial. So it all, it, the complaint definitely the manner of there is it an initial visit is it the first time i've ever been to the site so in which case i probably want to take as much as i can because i don't know what the heck i'm going to run into because i only know what i may have done in a little bit of recon or got off the phone from talking to my client so that ends up being a little bit broader scope of stuff i want to bring so i'm prepared especially if that initial survey that i'm there for is significantly removed from either life or my home okay i can't just get something if i need it um, if i'm three or four hours away or i'm up in the mountains on a pipeline or something like that and it's the first time i've been on that visit i'm probably going to throw a few more things to make sure that i can can uh keep all of my equipment running and getting the data that i want because ultimately i'm there to assess but i'm also there to take to collect some data points. So that's kind of our purpose when we're there. The comprehensive nature of the survey, you know, as we said with the complaint, you know, that might be very focused and I, and I don't have to worry about a whole lot of other things, although they're there in your periphery, but that's not your main purpose for being there. So you have to make sure you stay on task sometimes, but if it's comprehensive soup to nuts, you know, then then the sky's the limit. Kind of like an initial survey, you're going to take, you're going to make sure you have a little bit more in your kit with you, so that you can entertain any types of problems that you might come about. Again, the 
the next one, the limited scope. If I'm only doing air sampling for formaldehyde for a particular job, say it's you know working on some powder coating or something like that, then I may not have to worry about too much else. But if I or if I'm just looking at ventilation, you know, I, I have other observations I make, but I'm not assessing them, so I may not need as much equipment. Um, noise is probably the easiest one. Um, to do, but it, it has its it, um, nuances that we need to be aware of. You know, windscreens have a tendency to get beat up when they're on the worker. Okay, so you know, we might want to have some spares of those. And then I already mentioned about indoor air quality has its own set. Is it uh, is it an active site where we have water intrusion and we're we're at that stage, or is it more subtle indoor air quality where we're not quite sure what the heck it is? And it's just a complaint and we're trying to kind of do the sleuth and figure out what's there, um, what might be contributing to it. So I may need a little bit different. You know, one one might not need anything, maybe some swabs or some tape lifts and the other, if I'm thinking microbial and the other, geez, I might need a PID or something to that effect to try to get into to, to some MVOCs or something. So I start out with my go kit. I, when somebody calls and I need to go out on the field, I want to be able to grab one item and, and I know I have my basic cadre of um, PPE, if you will, what I'm going to be wearing when I'm on the job site that's in this bag. So it starts out with my, my shoes, my hat, my safety glasses, okay. When I go out on a job site, I t used to always use a fishing vest. And that gray one, I still have it. I wear it in class when I'm doing air sampling just to get in the mood. So I'll put on my, my, my sampling vest. It has all the pockets so I can stuff everything in there. I'm kind of moving into the new air because we want to be able to see, be seen so we don't get hit when we're on these job sites. So I did buy a surveyor's um, high-vis suit that I use um, when I'm out on a job site nowadays, especially if I'm on a construction job site, they have requirements for high-vis, so I can meet that and I still have all the pockets that I want. I still like to get a little better quality, so if anybody has any insights, um, I, I bought a 3M one and I forget what the other brand, I bought two different ones they're like 20 or 40 dollars and I don't really like either one of them, I don't mean to disrespect 3M, I love 3M, but uh, I just thought it was yeah it needed I I I would like it to be a little better quality because it, it, I'm not just uh you know somebody on the job site I'm I, I wear it infrequently but when I do I'm wearing it all day and I usually have pockets stuffed full of stuff so I'd like it just to be a little bit better quality so if anybody has any ideas for me I'm I'm open to suggestions to get a little better visi vest to wear as my my on-site sampling vest if you will. Um, I always throw in a filtering face piece, so I always have one of those in my go kit so that I have a mask um, just in case I need it for something. Uh, if I'm going to have particulates, then yeah, it'd be nice to be able to throw an N95 filtering face piece on. Obviously, a pen or pencil, paper tablet, those are kind of go without saying. Now, some of you probably don't even use that because you're more modern than I am and you're, you're using a tablet. A, like a, uh, a Microsoft Surface Pro or something, and maybe you've forgone the, the pencil paper route and you do everything digitally. I know that's more and more. I love to take the pictures. So I did love when I was working with the state, with the state consultation program, um, we did everything with a tablet and we had our, our stuff. So that kind of went away from paper and pencil. So definitely I could use my, my use the tablet and pencil probably a better avenue as long as you have if you need connectivity and you have connectivity a cell phone we don't leave home without a cell phone i joke with my students all the time i said you have one resource we start out every job i said you, you start out with a certain cadre of data collection methods called your senses and i said right behind that you have a cell phone. I said, I bet you most of you don't even go anywhere, including the bathroom, without using, without having your cell phone in your pocket or with you somehow. So I said, that's a really good resource to to keep in mind when you're out on a job site. So it's in my go bag. Usually it's in my pocket or it's in the car already, so it doesn't even have to make it to a go bag. Um, 
sometimes a point and shoot camera although with the new cell phones the cameras are better and better but you yeah, may not want to be limited to the the space on your cell phone i know i'm limited by the amount of space on my cell phone so i'm always um, running into that because i don't like putting my pictures out into the internet you know i don't like to share what i got from a client site out on the uh, the internet site on one of those types of web-based servers I, I just don't i don't feel comfortable doing that so um i either i'll use my cell phone a little bit but everything's on my cell phone it doesn't go outside my cell phone then i download it from there or i have a point and shoot an, an old canon point and shoot camera in there i really need to upgrade it because technology's gotten a lot better with those cameras um, because you know pictures are a fabulous thing and then I don't want to underestimate make sure you have a water bottle so that would be my one thing the cell phone and the second thing would be make sure you have a water bottle with potable water in it um, when you get out on a job site I've been on enough job sites that water refreshment wasn't the most readily available thing so having your own bottle of water that you know you like to drink is probably the most refreshing thing you can have um, from the go kit so this is just my basic generic go kit okay and you see my bag in the bottom right hand corner it's an old helmet bag i got from my days on the enterprise um, so they put their aircraft helmet in there and I just use that. It sits in the back of my car. It has my hard hat. It has the respirator. It has steel toed shoes. I use low shoes. Okay. I'm not a high, a high top type of, um, person. Although if I was on a job site, like, uh, when I, when I went out recently, I went out to a, a pipeline to do a survey and a confined space entry issue and i wished i would have had a high top to get some ankle support because the terrain was pretty miserable up there that i needed to go through and then always safety glasses and what you can't see in this picture here is hearing protection so i always have a set of earplugs in in my go kit as well so i would i would ask for you to share that kind of information um what's in your go kit if you will i mean for lack of a better cliche question but um just to uh brian i've had a couple people comment on okay i don't bringing, see any bringing band-aids band-aids oh. is a one or first aid kit would be a good idea yep yep uh, absolutely. and and some protein bars absolutely both great comments i told you this was just the start point so this wasn't <laughs> I, guess. I must I admit guess. I, I forgot all about the the protein bars i usually do have some type of a some type of a one of the not necessarily a protein bar but you know one of those little bars breakfast bars or whatever in here as well i forgot all about that so thank you couple couple more suggestions tape measure socks flashlight okay well you'll see a couple of those socks are a good idea especially if the weather's bad okay that's a good comment the other one other two i think you'll see as we progress from the go bag into the actual kit Okay, so as I, I walk into my kit, okay, now we start getting into some things. I still have a pen and a marker because we need to mark everything if we're taking samples. I always have a cadre of labels, okay, so that I can stick my own labels on things if I need to. So I have just generic labels. A light, which somebody mentioned, I, I have an old MSA. Actually, I got this at an IH conference years ago. And it continues to work. So I just leave it in my kit. I take the batteries out and I replace them periodically so they don't corrode the inside because it's an old school one. But the new LED ones are probably way better, way more efficient. Okay. But this one I've had, geez, forever. Um, and it just kind of hangs out in there. And then, as most of us, I don't think there's an IH out there that wouldn't say one of the number one things is that silver thing right there in the in the middle, which is duct tape. You know, you can't go anywhere without a roll of duct tape um, on there. I usually have electrical tape and packing tape um, in, in my kit as well, as you can see the black and then the red for the packing tape. Because when I try to do sampling, if I need to send it off to the lab like Galson or EMSL or RJ Lee or any of those labs out there, I use, I use various ones depending on where I'm at. Um, 
I like to be able to get everything done while I'm out on site, get it packed up and get it off to the lab so it can get analyzed as quickly as possible. So I try to keep that cadre of tape inside of my kit as well. Smoke tubes, because I, I'm a big one for hierarchy of control. So if there happens to be a ventilation control that is somehow related to what I'm evaluating, I'm gonna use a smoke tube just to make sure it does what it says it's doing and, and training that contaminant into the, the, uh, into the ventilation system. So the easiest way for me is to have smoke tube. Back in the, the old days, I think some, if there's some old timers in there, I consider myself an old timer nowadays. I've been doing it for about 30 years now. So I guess I am an old timer um, that you could ask a worker that had a cigarette and grab their cigarette and use that as your smoke tube. But those days are kind of gone away. I mean, they're still available, but we're trying to get people not to smoke. Um, so I take my own smoke tube so I can do, do it myself. I always have some wipe samples, especially if I'm doing welding, anything with metals, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna have wipe samples so I can evaluate where they, where they eat, where they break, and make sure that the contaminants don't migrate over to where they're eating and drinking. Um, hand sanitizer, especially in today's age, I can't even imagine anybody going anywhere without a thing of hand sanitizer. So I always have a, a bottle of hand sanitizer in there. But once you get out and you're milling around, looking at the job site, and getting in and around all the different equipment and talking with employees, you're going to touch something, you're going to move something. And the next thing you know, you got it all over your arms and your hands, the dust or whatever that happens to be settled. So having um, hand sanitizer, and then going along with that, Kim wipes her disposable cloth, something to wipe yourself down or wipe your equipment down. Because I'm sure many of you have taken samples and your equipment comes back pretty, pretty dirty and you need to wipe it off before um, you want it. If you're, if you're loaning it, renting it, getting it from the lab before you send it back, you need to, to wipe it down so that you're not giving them all the crud when you send it back to the lab. Or if it's yours, you want to maintain it because you spent good money on it. So you want to maintain it. So the easiest way is when you're out there. But even if you're just wiping yourself up, um, Kim wipes or disposable cloth along with the hand sanitizer works really well. I always have Ziploc bags because I always seem to want to take a bulk sample of something if I'm looking at different things. Um, so I want to be able to throw a bulk sample into a Ziploc bag. I found quart bags to be kind of the jack of all trades. They're just big enough for most things and not too big to be unwieldy to pack into your kit. So I keep four or five of those in, in my um, kit. You'll see them wrapped up here next to the, on the top, top tray there. Um, I always have a calculator and a TLV booklet, which is a little bit obscured, but it's on the left-hand side there. So I do keep a TLV booklet. I find a TLV booklet, I'm a little, a little geeky here, but the TLV booklet I find is is a light read if I'm uh, just kind of hanging out, waiting, waiting on sampling. If I'm just doing a lot of sampling and not walking around at a particular time, I'll pull out the TLV booklet and I'll read through some things like that. But I'm a little geeky that way sometimes. Supplemental power. I don't know how many of you have gone out and you've been using your phone or whatever, and the next thing you know, it's dead or your camera and it's dead. Okay, so I usually have a supplemental power, which you can't really see in any of the pictures, but I do have a small um, rechargeable pack. I use it for my cell phone. I bought it several years back when I did the ride across Iowa. Um, the rag bry, um, it was a great way in the middle of the day to be able to charge up. It's a nice slim line. It's about the same size as my calculator here. It's a little bit slimmer than my calculator here. I just make sure it's charged up and I can charge up my phone a couple of three different times. Um, or if I needed to, I could run my calculator off of it, but my calculator is solar. So I don't usually have to worry about power for it. But I do find that my battery in my phone dies on a regular basis. So I've, I've chosen to throw this supplemental power in um, just so that I can, I can easily recharge my cell phone because it is one of those tools we've become very dependent on. I know I have. Um, and then I always have personal and target business cards. And what I mean by that is I have my own business card, of course, okay? Because you get on a job site and you have a couple other contractors or whatever that are on a job site that aren't your primary 
um, can, um, client, you may want to be able to give them your um, business card, but it's always good to be able to give your business card to whomever you're meeting with so that they have that contact information about you. Um, but I always have target ones too. So I may have, um, I have a couple of, one is for machine guarding. So if, if I have a, an issue with machine guarding, cause I'm not, I know a bit about machine guarding, but you know, if they're looking at trying to put in guards and, and manufacture guards, um, I have a resource for that. So I, I hand that card out. I have structural engineer who's a good friend of mine so that if, uh, if I have fall protection issues, anchorage in issues, I point them towards him because that's something that he does is he will design the anchorage points for them. And, and that's become more and more prevalent um, as I go out. People want permanent uh, anchorage points uh, in on their buildings and in their locations. And, and he can do that kind of stuff. So I have his cards available as well um, so that you know, maybe it'll kick a little business his way as well. So it's us helping small businesses, helping small businesses. I'm all about small business. That's why I went with, uh, I mean, I don't have a problem with big business, but I, I've definitely, my last 10 years or so, I've, I've spent more with small business and being able to help them out. Um, some other items that are thrown in there. You, you could see from the picture, there were some things, there's scissors, there's a pocket knife, I got a spatula in here. Okay, so there's a few different things that are showing up here. Um, but some other stuff, I, I usually keep an all purpose, like a Leatherman tool, multi, multi purpose tool in there. I always have a set of tweezers and usually a small set of needle nose. Okay, because you never know when you have to change something around. Um, sometimes I need the forceps just so that I can take, if I'm doing isocyanate or I'm doing one of those kinds of samples where I need to take the media off and put it into a fixing solution. And then a screwdriver. I take a full size screwdriver, but I always, I always have a small screwdriver too. I mean, MSA and a couple of the other companies have their logos on them, so you can get them free when you go to the conferences and you just throw a, throw one into your kit um, so that you're able to tweak things in your um, in your equipment as you're as you're using it. OK, so there's these these different tools Then in the bottom, the, the big section of the bottom. I usually I always carry around a spare pump, so I have one spare sampling pump. Um, that I keep with me and a calibrator. So I, and since I was able to get a TSI, it's nice and convenient. Uh, it fits in there nicely. So, and then I have a dry cal as my, my one that sits at home instead of carrying it with me because this one's just so much more convenient. I always throw in the high and the low flow sampling train so that I'm pretty versatile. I can use that one pump to do both. Okay. And then a belt for the pump or a vest but I usually have a belt in here so that when I need to put it on a person and they don't have a belt, I have a belt for the pump, okay? Now, sometimes I, I actually have a sampling vest, an air sampling vest as well that I just kind of throw into the car because um, sometimes it's just a little more convenient, but um, most times I can get away with a belt. And I have a very large web belt that I bought off of Amazon and it goes, I think it's like 60 inches around. So I can get all those Yogi Bear guys out there when I'm sampling. Seems like whoever I'm sampling is the biggest person I've ever met in my life. So, and they don't have a belt on and I'm trying to put a pump on them. So I, I bought the biggest belt I could possibly find. I recently did some silica sampling and the guy I was sampling was a little bitty thin, thin guy. I think he was a hundred pounds soaking wet. And I, I wrapped the belt around them three times, I think, because I had so much extra belt on them. Um, but there was no way I was gonna put it on his pants, even though he had a belt, because he didn't have enough bone and muscle on him to be able to hold up the pump. So I was worried. So I, I threw my own belt on him and put my pump on. Now you can buy cool, I'm kind of cheap. You know, I know there are holders that are integrated with their own clip on and I do have a set of those I just don't routinely leave them in my kit because they take up a little more space but I do have those SKC has them and I think there's a few others that have them as well that fit the pump nicely and have a cool little bit you got to pay 
pay money for them. So if you have the money for that, great. It'll work really well. I'm cheap, so I just have a really long web belt that, that works for putting a pump on it. I usually keep media, generic media for basic metals and dust, um, organic vapors. So, you know, a basic 22601 from SKC that does a lot of your organic vapors, various solvents. I will keep them inside here so that I have them. I can calibrate, I can throw a pump on, even if I wasn't prepared on the particular day thinking I'm going to do sampling, but now I could take a kind of a kind of a grab sample on that day. Um, I do have a WBGT, which I may not put in the middle of the winter, but in the summertime, definitely. But if I'm going to a foundry, I'll leave my WBGT in if I'm hitting to a foundry where I know I have a fair amount of heat source inside of the facility. Um, but if I'm on a construction site in the middle of the summer, this, this little meter, even though it's cheap, is worth its weight in gold. It helps me get a little more data to be able to explain to them why they need to have reduced work hours so that people can cool down and, and refresh so that they don't get into a heat stress situation. I also usually carry around an, either an SLM or a dosimeter. Now I know there's apps on your um, phone that are getting better and better, but I made it my thing. I just carry around a dosimeter and that kind of takes the place of my sound level meter and it kind of does double duty um, but it's nice it's handy it's small it's a little dated now but it does the job that i need it to do um, so i keep one of those i calibrate it before i leave in the morning and then i can use it while i'm there uh, i do have a vein airflow meter in here Okay, so if I'm inside, I can get airflow measurements, especially if it's cold out and I want to look at wind chill. So I throw throw that in. It just kind of hangs out in there. And then an airflow meter. I like this because it's not terribly the expensive. Okay, so you can buy one of these and it, it, it kind of just sits in your, your kit and you get it calibrated periodically. It's not a not a huge investment, which is nice. Okay, plus it gives you instead of just a smoke tube, you can actually get some definitive information from from having your hot wire anemometer on there. Okay, so I have a few different things, but if you look in here, there's a couple other pieces of, of equipment. Um, one is this I, use, I have to be able to take, say, a combustible dust sample because periodically you'll have a buildup of dust and you'll be curious about it. So I have a, a bottle, a Nalgene bottle in there so that I can get a sample for um, combustible dust. I have the tubing, which I already mentioned, but then I have a um, end, endoscope here so that it actually interfaces Bluetooth to my phone so that I can put that down into and behind items so that I can see like behind a wall, especially if I'm doing indoor air or microbial, um, but sometimes I just want to be able to get behind a large piece of equipment and this makes it actually, I've used it once now for that purpose of being able to get back behind where I couldn't just see and I was able to snap a picture and, and actually see behind a piece of equipment without trying to climb all over the piece of equipment to get where I wanted to go. And then this part for microbial is just a moisture meter for the, the building materials. I've had that thing forever and it just keeps on working. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to argue with it. It just kind of permanently resides in my kit. So that's the basics of what's in my kit. So I, again, I'll, I'm always open to learning what other people put in. I love the first aid kit. Um, there's one in my car, so I didn't even think about that as part of this kit. So that was a great suggestion and the power bar. Um, but this at least allows me to do the basics. So this is the basic field kit, IH field kit, and my go kit. Then I have some items in my car. Okay, so I have supplemental power. I talked about a small supplemental power basically just for my phone really for my phone to keep it running, especially if you're out in a remote area and it's pinging out, it's gonna bleed your battery quick. So that other um, small uh, supplemental power is great. But then I bought this Halo not too long ago, my actually my wife's request. And it's nice because not only 
can I, I can charge things. I can use it as a jump start if, if my car dies, which luckily, knock on wood, has never happened. Um, but I can also power my computer with it, which is pretty handy. Okay, so if you're out remote and your battery life starts going down, this thing will allow you to run pretty much the rest of the day on this power source. So that's a nice handy tool for a hundred bucks. It was definitely worth the money. Uh, and that was at my wife's request because things were dying on me, okay? But you can actually, because I have run my computer, my Macintosh, off of my Halo, okay? So it does work. I always keep a drill, just a battery power drill with a quarter inch bit, because if I want to get behind a wall, I want to be able to drill a hole. And I usually have spackling and a putty knife in there. Um, and then last but not least, and I'm sure there's other things that you would put in, especially wintertime, you might want a blanket or a pillow or, or something like that in case your, your car gets died or you get stuck on the road and the highway somewhere. Um, this is more for the sampling side of it. So it wasn't an, a full out emergency kit that I would put in for, for weather conditions. But coffee mug, definitely have to have your coffee mug. I, I don't know if any of you, I'm retired Navy. So coffee, I drink coffee all morning and half the afternoon. So I, I always have a coffee mug with me, um, with typically with coffee in it. Then the last piece of this is, these are items that are more specialized that I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna have ready access to. I may, but being a, you know, one man band, uh, just a private entity trying to uh, help folks out. These are where Reiko comes in. Um, and they're great because I can call them and, and pretty much anywhere I can get some of these specialty items. Either I can get it sent to there or they send it to me and I take it with me, but then I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to pay for the, uh, the uh, calibration of them. So uh, I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to just put a plug out for Reiko, but yeah, I'm doing this for them. They've been been great to me over the years. So um, these are, are a little bit more money buying a Q-Track or buying a PID, a 5-Gas. You guys know if you've done any kind of sampling like this, you know, you're talking a few thousand bucks to buy one of these, plus you got to keep them maintained. So to be able to get it from an entity that's able to take care of you anywhere you're at, pretty much in the world, um, that's a nice sell. There's no reason for me to have to own one of these. Um, I can just get them from my rental. But so here's a few of them, the five gas meter, like the MSA one here, you could do the industrial scientific. There's a few different ones out there. The PID, okay, whether you're doing the Ray systems or you're doing ion science. Um, the port account, which I show in the bottom right-hand corner, I mean, that, that's a huge, most of us can't afford to have one of those just on our list at 20,000 bucks or whatever they cost. Um, so to be able to rent them from, from a company is great. An IAQ meter, Q-Track, this is, I use this. This is pretty much one that it, it broaches between what I would rent and what I would want to put in my actual kit and have ready access to. And because we had, if you remember back here, I could get the, the Q-Track from Alnar from TSI with multiple probes. So I would be able to have my own version and do double duty with, with one meter. So this one starts pushing in, okay, it might be something that I want to invest and have because I can do ventilation if I have that probe and then I can do indoor air quality if I wanna, if I have that probe. So this one bleeds over, but they do have them, you can get them, but you have, and then the octaband analyzer, because I, I love being able to chop it down. Technology nowadays, geez, our, our dosimeters are giving us octaband. So that one's becoming less of an issue, okay? Um, the octaband analyzer, just because technology is marching forward on us. Um, so, but there's a lot of other equipment as you would specialize depending on the nature of your visit or your survey, your, your inspection, whatever terminology you want to use, the reason you're there, there's a whole litany of equipment that you want, that you might not want to have just and pay good money for and have sitting on a shelf that you can rent and, and, and you have access to, you know, for dust sampling, various different size dust sampling, 
stack checking, you know, there's the sky's the limit. There, there's all kinds of things that you might want to use and, and be able to rent. So I guess one of the things that should go in my bag up here, I said the TLV booklet, I should probably have Rako's, a printout of Rako's stuff that I can, I can rent, okay? So do we have any other suggestions from folks that are on? We have about 200 plus people online. What other kind of comments are they making that's in their kit? You yeah, know, I've got a, I've got a bunch here. Um, I think what I'm going to do is compile this together and put okay. the list on our site and I'll send out a message to everybody that it's there. Wonderful. I'm glad that you guys are, are sharing with that because that's what I wanted to do with this. This is just an introduction. This is kind of what I put together. Um, and the reasons that I put these things, and I'm sure most of you have been out in the field, I, 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 hopefully I, it's nothing necessarily new. This is probably a little different than what you used to get from, from Rayco and these. It's not a highly technical one. Um, but it, if you're new to doing IH sampling, then this is kind of a jump point for you, and you'll make your own kit. Uh, that's what I kind of have my introductory IH students, the juniors that come through is, during the course of um, the semester, they are creating their own field kit of things that they need to have inside of their, what they want to have in their field kit. So that's kind of a, a basic item that we work on throughout the semester while they're learning how to take samples. And with that, I would open it up, I guess, to questions, but I thank you for your time. Got a couple questions here. Do you calibrate pumps beforehand or on site? Uh, I am an old schooler. I will calibrate on site. That's why I have the calibrator in my kit. Uh, let me see. What else do we got here? Even mentioned... when I get pumps from the lab, I end up calibrating with my own primary standard. You mentioned both TSI and ion science. Do you have any experience with the air qual handhelds? I do not. So I'm no, sorry, I can't help you out there. We do carry some of the air qual equipment here, uh, Rico Rents. Uh, so we have a, some experience with it if you're looking for more specifics. Cool, there you go. Um, uh, have you ever used the NIOSH heat app? Yes, actually I just, my first section in the senior class is heat because it's physical hazard so we start with heat because it's in the fall semester so i try to take advantage of it still being hot outside in in pennsylvania and we use the niosh heat app as part of our lab with that when they're doing um heat outside and they're doing their jumping jacks and putting on their tyvek suits and whatnot to experience what heat really means like i said i've got a good list going here so you know the other the other big one is bringing your sunscreen no one wants oh, yeah. to get burned. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, sunscreen. That's good. Good idea. Very good. Thank you. Uh, do you store PDF instruction manuals on your smartphone? Yes, I do. That's I have idea. a manual for every piece of equipment that I'm going to use. I take the manual. It's part. It's on my. It's on my OneDrive. I use Microsoft OneDrive primarily. I used to use Dropbox, which is good. <laughs> and I just put it all out there. So as long as I have connectivity, I'm good. Now, if your question is, do I just put it on resident on my smartphone? That's probably not a bad idea. Um, that way, if I don't have connectivity, I can still get to my my owner's manuals if I if I need them. What about UFP ultra fine particle real time samplers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't carry one with me, but that would be something if I'm Thinking about that, I would probably call Rayco for. Below 0.1 micron, do you have any suggestions for equipment? I do not. I do not. Mm. Yeah, we have the TSIP track. Yeah. And that's the one I've used, is the, the, the P track from TSI. I mean, their stuff's pretty user friendly. All right. Like I said, I'll put together this list and post it on our website and uh, send out notification. Uh, Brian, thank you very much for the presentation. If anybody else has any specific application questions, feel free to give us a call 866-RENT-EHS 
our 866-736-8347. You can also reach me by email at matt at racorents.com. If you wanna know more about the technologies of supply, please follow us on social media. We put out lots of good technical tips on my blog, blog.racorents.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do record all these sessions, which we'll send out the announcement uh, probably Monday or Tuesday of next week. Uh, if there are topics you'd like us to cover in these webinars, please send me an email with the subject. We have access to lots of product and process specialists. Please let me know again at matt at racorents.com. At this point, if there are no other further questions, we will conclude. Let me just look through, see if there's... Uh, if somebody wants to see the first slide with the high vis vest again. I do have somebody who sent me a link for a vest they like. I'll I'll put that on the sheet okay. as well. Um, yeah, lots of good suggestions out here. Good, 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 uh, good. What about ergonomics? Any good tools? Uh, actually, I'm not the ergonomist guy, so I always defer that, especially here at IUP, because I have two researchers here that that is their forte. So I don't actually get involved. If I need ergonomics, I kick them over to my my counterparts here at the university. So I I am not the best one for ergonomics. Right. Somebody's mentioned human tech systems. Okay. Um, we teach a whole ergonomics lab for our undergrads and grad students. And we have, like I said, we have two folks that are, that's their forte is ergonomics. So that's what they publish in and work in. So they, they are the gurus for that. I've never heard of this instrument. A Ganometer? G-O-N-I-O-M-E-T-E-R? I haven't either. Sorry. Uh, hard and soft tape measures. Yep, tape measures. They were in the in the thing, but I didn't hmm. specify them. So yes, good. Oh, for good ergonomics using AI. Are there apps out there for? Yeah, I'm sure there are. AI app. Oh, neat. I'm sure there are. But I can put you in touch with our folks. Uh, measurements for force. We carry a Mark 10 force meter for that sort of thing. All right, that will conclude it. Uh, we will send out uh, the uh, certificate of completion to everybody that's attended. Um, I see that as a question out there. So, all right. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Bye -bye.